turned over a bright metal shell that rippled when She I... says human longing for mystery leads to a commonality of belief in immortality. Dad's late or I'm early. Either way, I have time to scout the pens. Kim... Redemption and claustrophobia, what artists understand. Not valuing... The... I've lived in Nebraska half of my life. Uh, went to school here, married, raised my children here. Then the other half of my life I've been uh, traveling, living in Alaska and Missouri. But I do consider myself a Nebraskan. Even though I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, my mother's from the East, so there's that influence. Uh, I paid attention to language because she spoke differently than my father. I think I was an adult when I heard, and I paid attention to words. He said, Winda, Pilla. I didn't know he said that. My friends made fun of me because I said, egg, leg, measure, pleasure, treasure. And all my friends said, no, it's egg, leg, meg. <laughs> you know, I said, it can't be. There's not an A there. Anyway, all of those things are, they have influenced me, I think, as a writer, paying attention to language, partly because my parents were very different in their use of language. Uh, they're both college educated. I'm many generations away from the farm. Even back to 1751 in Germany, we've, my mother's side has always been city people. My father's people were city people in Ireland, Donegal, Ireland. And here, until the Civil War, then a lot of records were born, were burned. <laughs> so um, kind of have an old world feel. I don't have a settled feeling like this is really my place because I've traveled so much. It's right in my heart. I really do feel like a Nebraskan. Well, I'm reminded too, and I think I might have said this uh, the last time I read here, that there's a quote by a Japanese poet, and I've been looking 20 years and nobody can tell me who that poet is. You can best see the mountain from the seashore. When I was in Alaska, I would write Nebraska poems. When I was in Nebraska, first back here, after 11 years up there, I wrote Alaska poems, but here I am. So uh, many people, I think, in the United States experience that because we are, we're travelers. Some of us still have that pioneer spirit, that adventuresome, and we don't want to stop and dig. Mm. <laughs> I think looking Nebraska, looking at Nebraska. My family, all of us, went to the Platte River where Bosselman's is on I-80 outside Grand Island. I used to ride my bicycle from Hastings there. That was a place that belonged to us, to the Hill family, which is my maiden name. And my mother, because the land was so different in New York State, the Adirondack Mountains and all of that, in fact, some people say, where are you from? And I say, oh, I was conceived in the Poconos. <laughs> <laughs> Born in Pittsburgh, raised in Hastings, Nebraska. Mm -hmm. um, but because of that, my father's father, my grandfather, would say, Esther, don't go to sleep when we're driving. Look, look, uh -huh. see the wild rose. He'd stop and get out and pick a wild rose for her. She thought there was nothing to see. So I learned, in fact, in some of my writing, I've said the eye goes far to find what it sees. And we have to just be a little more careful about what we see here than the big splashes that we have in mountain country and in Alaska. Yes. Spectacular, you know. Well, they're spectacular to our quiet beauty, I think. Well, I think growing up in Hastings, Nebraska, where there was a college, my parents both said they would never live in a community that had no college. Um, not that we were culture vultures <laughs> or anything, but it influenced us. And that's part of Nebraska. In fact, I would like to know what part of the population are city people in Nebraska rather than rural people. We have a lot of rural um, history to really enjoy, to really revere. Willa Cather being one of them, Lauren Isley being another, and many writers writing today. A lot of the writers capture this bucolic, pastoral sense of living, which I think most Nebraskans, 
maybe only rem half remember, some of them. Only some of them half remember. I would say most Nebraskans didn't have that. But I've never done a study on it. It's something that we, I don't know if we romanticize it or not, the way in Alaska, living out in the bush, hauling your own water, that, that that's sort of romanticized. Mm -hmm. But I, I fervently believe that if we don't remember the pioneer days and that they're lost, many of us will not know what passed before, which also makes me remember the Native Americans. It does distress me to hear people saying, my parents were on this land for a hundred years. The Native Americans were here thousands of years, thousands of years. But that's a whole other story. My grandfather, with a fifth grade education, this is another influence, um, and there are two books that pertain to this in Girl Talk. Uh, he was an archaeologist with a fifth grade education. He trained Lauren Isley in the field. He trained a retired um, curator of anthropology at the Smithsonian. My grandfather would never hire somebody to go out with him if they didn't have a knife. He'd say, oh, I have a splinter. And he'd ask his phone, could I see your knife? If the knife was not in good condition, my granddad was just like an old tramp, really. If it wasn't in good condition, if he didn't have one, that man didn't get the job. See, so there are so many conflicting influences regarding Nebraska that I hardly know where to begin. They change all the time. That might be another series of poems. I have about 40 or 50 of them that I think, even at my advanced age, that I'm not old enough to write. After being in Alaska and the problems with the Native Americans up, to, up there, they're still trying to keep their language. They're still trying to keep their ways of life when sports hunters go up and chase the elk way off into the woods. And these people don't have their way of life anymore. It's a whole other story. But that, that's something that engages me. I might want to write about, again, about the uh, Nebraska natives, what's happening to them. I think, in addition to what I have said, um, the storytelling. My mother's people were great storytellers. I heard the same stories over and over and over and over and over again about my grandfather's German beer garden in Schenectady, New York, how he had lemonade for the little old ladies, <laughs> the little old ladies, every Sunday. And he went to America. He came to America to be an American, not to uh, go into Germantown, for instance. So and those are other things that I'm writing about sometimes, but not in the work I'm reading tonight. Um, the influences, uh, as I say, of telling stories before television, before radio, uh, that way of life is important to me and those people who tell the stories. Um, of course, the poets that I read and the poets that I've met who pay attention to language mm -hmm. and are very concerned about language that has a life of its own and that will outlive us Language will outlive us. Um, the other influences in people. Well, I could say all of my teachers, all of my teachers, um, my family, my granddaughters, my son and daughter and their families, my brothers. I was raised with two brothers. One of them doesn't give a rat's left ear <laughs> about poetry. Just doesn't know what to say about it. And he's very dear to my heart. We have other things to talk about. The influences, um, I would say, in poetry, of course, I studied with Greg Kuzma and then also some with Bill Clefcorn. I've studied with uh, Carolyn Fouché, Bill Stafford, um, well, probably dozens of people, Madeline Le Guin, no, Madeline DeFries, Madeline DeFries. It's been quite a while, but one prominent influence has been Carolyn Kaiser who is a woman of my height, and, but I'm not of her stature. She's, <laughs> even metaphorically, she's a little taller than I, so we share that. But she is a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, headed up the National Endowment for the Arts in poetry, uh, I think under Lyndon Johnson. But she's always been right there, taught at Columbia. She's in California now. Her work is absolutely wonderful. There are her books downstairs. Um, 
Her writing is very important to me. She has a lot of narratives, which I think I've learned from. This book has more narratives than it does uh, other styles of poetry. I always thought of myself as a nonverbal person because I played the piano, studied classical piano, taught classical piano, and I also played string bass. And I, oh, I hated to give, stand up and give a speech. I was very inarticulate. I really did stumble over words an awfully lot. Then when I went back to the university at the age of 37, I had 20 hours or something, but I went back to the university here. My son and daughter were in junior high, and I studied in the English department, of course. And uh, we had to keep a journal under Dudley Bailey, the uh, chair of the department. He and his wife did so much for this community, if you ever look into it. But he liked reading my journal, and I thought, that's odd. Nobody ever liked what I wrote, but I, I think part of writing, I didn't know I was a writer, but I've always written a lot of letters. So that might, might be the case. I don't know that I, I didn't grow up knowing I was a writer, no. I grew up knowing I had a very vivid imagination and uh, loving to be read to, loving to read, but loving poetry more than uh, fiction or nonfiction. But knowing that I'm a writer, sometimes I forget that I'm a writer. I get caught up in what I'm doing. And not, and, and not particularly writing but reading, too. It's hard to say what inspires me to write if, because sometimes the words just come. It's like I'm perhaps writing a letter and then it takes over and has a life of its own. On occasion, I will be saying something and it will become a poem. And I'll say, excuse me, and I'll go in the other room and write a poem, and these poems have nothing to do with one another. But um, dreams inspire me. History inspires me. My family inspires me, my friends. Nebraska inspires me. I have quite a few Nebraska poems, particularly in Staying the Winter. I have several of them in uh, Girl Talk, in that book. Art inspires me. I had many friends over the years who were visual artists. And so considering the difference between visual art well, there are very many similarities. And the written art, you know, in the girl talk, they're having a, a conversation and they're kind of quarreling. One is better than the other. And the visual artist gets to do all the talking. Tonight, I get to do all the talking. But <laughs> in, the, in the series, she does all the talking. And the uh, literary artist is sort of like interviewing her and bouncing ideas off of her. So art and music, their influence is in me, too. I think the best way for me has been evening, at night. Uh, there have been times when I really needed my sleep, and when I put my head on, down on the pillow, that moment before waking and sleeping, it's sort of a dream state. Sometimes I'll just have to say no, 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 and go to sleep. Other times it's uh, in notes. Uh, any of us, where we're walking down the street, suddenly some tune will come to us, or we'll start whistling or singing or have a sudden urge to skip up the step. You know, some of these irrational things that, and especially maybe singing, music. That impulse to, uh, to write is just there without any prompting. When I work, I do like it to be quiet. I don't like the radio on. Of course, with words, no, I'd listen to those. Music, I would be listening to all the music, the counterpoint, the harmonies, who's playing what. I don't want anybody around. I don't like to write in coffee houses. Too many distractions. I want to focus right on my work and be there. Part of that, I think, comes from studying classical piano because I was on my own and quiet for such a long time uh, practicing until I got it perfect. You know, as perfect as I could. <laughs> There's no such thing as perfection. Um, all of that time, I think, transfers over into writing, that quieting looking at each word, making sure each word is where I want it to be. Um, so that, that's one way that I work, I think, is it, or it stems off. All right, because I was a writer, because I was a musician, that influences me and makes me 
pay attention, I think, to my writing, wanting to be alone, being careful about revision, practicing the poem. In fact, I've written an essay about practicing the poem. Um, I had a friend say once that he, in fact, he said, I write to win people over to my turf. Well, I don't have that streak in me. And partly it's because of piano. I played piano as a diversion to uh, entertain people or to entertain myself. The music, I'm interested in the music of language too. But whether the poem is, uh, or the music, is Baroque, whether it's uh, impressionistic, contemporary, 12-tone scale, romantic. I have all of those, so when I write, I write in different styles, too. And I think that music has been a great influence to me th in my life, that I don't just focus on one kind of writing. Yeah, in, like in fact, in this book, I have the girl talk poems, and then I have the lyrics and the na other narratives place poems, some Nebraska poems, set off the, uh, the table of contents. Rural talk is here. Five spaces over are all these other lyrics, which I see as unspoken, sort of subterranean subtexts mm -hmm. to hold the poems up. Each of us is thinking something else, some part of our life, when we're talking to somebody else. Right? That subtext, actors that talk about a lot about that. Like, all right, well, what's the subtext here? What are you really trying to say? See? Or wh what else is going on in your life? So that's how I envision this book. And maybe that's another way arts have entered into my writing. That there's this other unspoken narrative that holds up the discussion between the literary artist, who is fictional, and the visual artist, who is fictional discussing their work, discussing love, art, work, AIDS, family, the economy, well, not the economy so much as the world, disorder, and then these personal poems. When I think of voice in my work, I can't see that I have it, but I remember a long time ago, Stephen Spender was at Hastings College, and I'm talking 1976. Bill Clefcorn and I, Greg Kuzma and Jack Collum, who He's in Colorado. Greg Kosminski has done a book of his with Backwaters Press. The four of us were invited out to honor Stephen Spenders at Hastings College. See, that's how important that college is to our community of Nebraska. Um, and we read. I was very embarrassed. He was sitting as, Stephen Spender was sitting as close to me as you are. And I said, we had just come from the chapel. All the students, professors were there to hear him. My heaven, I was almost 30 years younger than I am now. I was so embarrassed to be the first to read, and I stood up said, thank you, Mr. Spender, for reading from your very early poems, because that's what I'm doing, reading from some of my first poems. But after that event, even though I was reading these different poems, like a dream surrealist poem, uh, a narrative poem, a place poem, Bill Clefcorn, and I don't know how he gets it, but he said, I hear your voice in all of them. Now, he might not agree with that now, but in 1976, he said your voice permeates all the different styles that you use when you're writing. I guess I have a high tolerance for differences in people, and I have a high tolerance for differences in poems. Uh, Mark Strand was a New York City poet whose work I really liked, but then for a while in the 1980s, people I've never met him, but people would say, he's writing Mark Strand parodies. <laughs> That's one thing I didn't want to do, is write a Nancy McCleary parody. I wanted to write what came. Yes. And it might go down to naught. There's so many of us writing, but it's, you know, it's something I, I do have to do now, even though I did not have to write when I was younger. How oh, I do, how oh, I must write. When I'm writing, I don't really have an audience in mind at all. Just maybe it's to myself. I heard someplace, and I've written about it in this book, just a line or two, that the love poem is really talking to itself. Isn't that charming? I mean, you hear a, even a singer singing a love song. It's singing to itself. It's so wonderful. <laughs> so it's the music of the poem that I address myself to sometimes. Um, who the reader is, 
somebody that might find herself or himself in the work or be stretched to find something new in the world and find it through my work. No, I don't have a special audience. I don't write for children. I don't write for my family. I don't say that I write for me. I write for the sake of getting it down. I do still work with adults in writing, and many of them are writing place poems and Nebraska poems and the history of their people on the land, which I don't share, but I encourage them. I also uh, do encourage them to write other poems <clears throat> to find out something else about themselves to stretch their imaginations. But uh, some of them have self-published at my encouragement. I said, remember Emily Dickinson? Nobody published her. The editor said, no, thank you. Um, Walt Whitman. Now we have a, just a wonderful collection of Walt Whitman here in our archives that uh, Professor Price and Kathleen, Catherine, Kathleen, I'm sorry, it's Catherine Walter. It was on the front page of the paper yesterday. OK, so Walt Whitman, he published his own work. He hawked it in a wheelbarrow. He wrote his own blurbs on the book about how wonderful the poems were. OK, so I think everybody should. I think everybody should. And you can look in the writer's market to see where you could get your poems published. It's kind of a game that I don't enjoy much, how, how to encourage them. I discourage them from entering uh, contests because I have too many bad stories about evidence that people's manuscripts weren't read, or some poet was told, oh, your, your manuscript is won. And this poet said, well, I didn't even enter it. See, you know, they're just strange things. But if you want to pay, I just think it's sometimes you have to pay and you self-publish. I think there are a lot of things that I haven't covered. But I do know that some of my writing, I talked away by talking to it too much, talking about it too much, and to other people. I want to wait and see what comes. I have many subjects that I haven't written about. I have lots of bad poems drafts at home, piles and piles of drafts of poems that don't ever get to become poems. So part of that is getting rid of the wood pile, but I always hate to do that because there's an impetus there in what I've written before that might trigger. I don't know that it's an easy question for me to ask because I've talked it away on an, another group of poems once. I just want to write again. When I was teaching college <laughs> in Missouri, my students kept a journal uh, because I learned that from Dudley Bailey. I'd never been asked to write anything until I got to college here. So they keep a journal. And I say, here's something you want, might want to address. First of all, how many of you in this room have Northern European roots? We all hold, a few of them and I, hold up our honky arms, right? I said, OK. Just think about it. You line up 100 people in the, United, in the world. We are only 14 out of 100. 14 out of 100 people who have darker skin, who have a different way of living. I think we really ought to get over this superiority. That's something that's part of my life that I live, but I don't know that I'll write about it. I don't know that I won't write about it. I think I need to. Music, different. I have one, a, mu a poem about music in here that I'm several of them, more about music in my writing. Tonight I will be reading from Blown Roses, a beautiful book that uh, Denise Brady has made, and also from, it's sort of a, almost a preview, but the production is so beautiful. It's handset letterpress and uh, tie paper here. This cover is from France. These are papers from England, woodcuts by uh, Jamie Hackbart of Omaha. It's just a beautiful object. If these were in Portuguese, I would want to own this book. It's just a beautiful art object. Uh, also, I'll be reading then from the new book that just came to me two hours ago. Girl Talk, and Denise Brady did the cover of this. That's Denise and her sister, Girl Talking, down there. Uh, and as I, I might be repeating myself, but 
it is a discussion of a visual artist with a literary artist. The visual artist discusses a lot of the artwork that she's making and her whole philosophy and stance toward life. Just talking, talking folks, she breaks up, changing the subject, and sings, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. La, 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 life is but a dream. And then she continued, since I was a child, those little quotes have sounded just right to me. They've helped my art, my own little candle lit wherever I am, enough cash for art supplies, so wavy wine, dinner going out to hear the blues, letting the rest of the world go by till I learn a friend has breast cancer or a widow too frail to drive, can't get out of town, not even a day trip, so I drive, run errands, take a casserole. But the world, she continued, Belfast, Beirut, Bosnia, Johannesburg, Jerusalem. Well, she talks nonstop. And at one point in this poem, I think uh, the speaker, the other speaker, the literary artist, said uh, very gently, do you ever listen to what you say, my dear? If she ends it by, she says, the visual artist says, you know, lots of folks think I'm a hard-ass, egotist, whiner, whore, woos, dreamer, neurotic, paranoid, totally right-brained. Because I'm a friend, I whispered, my dear, do you ever think before you speak? Without missing a beat, she looked me dead in the eye. Rarely. If I did, I'd probably never say anything at all. Her last words to me that day. I thought without saying how, like each of us, a crystal held up to the light, one facet alone catching the most of it, and I look to be surprised. I think there's always something in everybody to be surprised about. But these two characters just got a hold of me. You know, they just... And then, right here are two Pawnee poems. So that's a little bit of what I'm reading tonight from both of those wonderful books. Good evening. My name is Joanna Lloyd, and I am curator of the Heritage Room. Welcome to the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors and the John H. Ames Reading Series. The Heritage Room is a special collection dedicated to preserving and promoting works by and about Nebraska authors. Currently, we maintain a collection of over 11,000 volumes written by more than 3,000 published authors from Nebraska. Okay. In one way of promoting these authors, the Heritage Room sponsors the John A. James Reading Series. This is our 138th Ames Reading. We're well established. I would like to thank the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association because it is through an endowment established through their volunteer efforts that we are able to bring you programs like these. You should feel that you can come in to visit our collection during public service hours for individual tours or just to enjoy the Heritage Room as a reading room where anyone who is interested can come in and read. Our reader tonight is Nancy McCleary. She is a Lincoln poet who holds a master's degree in creative writing from UNL. She has been awarded literature fellowships from Alaska and Nebraska councils, arts councils. Her books usually are published by small presses with special paper and beautiful design. Nancy has written five books of poetry, Night Muse, 1981, Postcards from London with original photos by Julie Bonet. Bonet. Yeah. Um, Staying the Winter from the Covington Press. Can't read it. 1987. Polar Lights from the Transcent Press, 1994. Blown Roses, 2001. And Girl Talk, Fresh from the Backwaters Press tonight. Nancy comments on her work by explaining that Night Muse, her first book, is Dionysian, that it comes to the poet in something of a dream state, and that Postcards from London, her second book, is Apologian, that comes from 
being willed and worked by the poet who sits down to write and says, I will write this poem. <laughs> she writes poetry either way. I am sure that she will read from Girl Talk. The poem calls for, the poem she calls hybrid tonight. Beyond that, the reading is up to her. Let me introduce you to Nancy McCleary. Joanna, thank you very much, and thanks to the public library. Is this good? The sound is good? Um, the John H. Ames series, 138 writers have been up here in the history of this. I'm very honored to be here tonight myself. Well, thanks to everybody, and thanks to uh, the publishers of poetry, uh, Denise Brady, who is here, Lone Roses, some of the Girl Talk poems are in there, in this and uh, Girl Talk, a larger collection of Girl Talk poems in this by Greg Kosminski in the Backwaters Press. Um, I think this can be said about both collections. Blown Roses, uh, Denise and her husband helped me find the title for that. Thank you. It's almost, as I see it, maybe an introduction or a, a preview of the whole Girl Talk. It's it's the best of the, almost good, I don't know. <laughs> it's, the, it's the best, the, the ones that she liked that are in here. Uh, I think I have it remembered that this is uh, English, Specklestone, the cover. Oh, you forgot. Well, I have forgotten. She used these wonderful papers. This is Thai, handmade paper from Thailand. Uh, I. I just have a cliché that I keep repeating myself by saying if this book were written in Portuguese, I would want it because it's a work of art. It's so beautiful. All of it is hand-stitched together back here. You must look at the spine. I don't know if there are any books here. There are some copies here for sale. But have a look at the spine. All of this is hand-sewn. This is an art that is not dying out, thanks to uh, Denise. Jamie Hackbart with uh, like wood cuts, but they're line of cuts, I guess. So ha have a look at this. The collection of poems, um, mostly narratives as these two women artists, one a literary artist and one a visual artist, they discuss different uh, things in, in their life. I've written here issues r ranging from love, sex, AIDS, and politi politics to other in events involving friends, family, and their work as artists, involving spiritual matters, those poems. And secondly, poems proposing to function as underpinnings or subtexts for the discussions. Uh, we're all right now, we have other things that are going on in our minds. In theater, they say, well, what's the subtext here for actors to get into the role? What else is going on in your life that makes it possible for you to uh, be John H. Ames in this play about the Heritage Room, right? Things are going on in our minds all the time. So these other little lyrics I think of as subtext. They're what hold up the narrative poems uh, in discussions. Um, well, I want to read the first poem that's in Girl Talk. Some, some of you have heard me read this. The visual artist is talking. The literary, the literary artist says only the last two lines. Girl talk, give, hold. Told me, now when I start these poems, they say told me. You see that it's the visual artist speaking. Told me, there's her work. She can hold it in her hands, observe it, and it suffices. That would be Denise holding this beautiful work of art. While the guitarist, she declared, holds a note and then gives it away like reading poetry aloud. You hold the silence, then feel it in your mind. Give it breath and let it go. So let's go to the zoo bar, she suddenly insisted. Find Magic Slim and the teardrops back from the Netherlands. Since we don't grieve so much anymore, we'll let the music do it for us. Get to feeling good about feeling bad. Go hear the blues, they never die. 
She was out the door dancing and humming, Ride, Sally, Ride. That's really Mustang Sally. Don't you love it? I do love the poems. I do love the blues, and so does this character who is nameless. Both of these characters are nameless. Um, I think that's the only one I will read here, but do have, do have a look at this book after the reading as an object of art. Girl Talk, um, uh, cover by Denise. I just love it. I really like it. And the wonderful book by Greg Husmiski. My thanks to all my teachers, fellow poets who have encouraged me and paid attention and are writing their own poems, I should say, telling their own stories at home. Who knows what notes they'll make to themselves as the years go by. Um, musicians and artists, I think, as well. I'd like to read um, Girl Talk AIDS Quilt. The visual artist is does a lot of work with uh, AIDS uh, quilt, quilts that she makes, a lot of other visual art too that surfaces in this book, but this is the AIDS quilt. And the literary artist is saying, she told me this, all right, told me she keeps the memory of him close and his photos in her studio. Her good buddy Fred, she said, one of those men who didn't think a woman had to have the same ambition as some men who raised their daughters as if they were sons. Choices, she said. Fred knew some things about hormones, though he'd not have lain everything at their feet. In a way, she told me, he was almost French when it came to men and women. Vive la différence, he'd say, though he was gay as the day was followed by night. And he knew not a little about love, to say nothing of sex, though we didn't discuss the, lot, the latter, not ever. Told me he was the first one, told me she was the first one he'd confided in about having AIDS. She hugged him, gave him tea and sisterly sympathy, but that was ten years ago. In a remote area of the Northwest, she said, I was painting my butt off for a little, if any, recognition, only for the love of it. Not many AIDS cases surfaced then, but Fred was a theater freak, and you'd have liked each other. You liking to stand up and read your poems and your various voices. He could have helped you some. You'd have enjoyed just looking at him, beautiful as Michelangelo's David, which I saw once in Florence, Italy, she said. Fred had a Great voice, a gay smile, a well-stocked kitchen, great CD collection, heaps of company over for potluck dinners, just throw your salmon in the oven, buy your own wine, cook up your brown rice, call your friends to bring whatever else they want to eat. Instant party. But best, those times he'd look long and hard at my canvases, sort of walk into them without saying a word, just absorbing my artwork on the way out, a hug and thanks. Imagine thanks for looking at my, looking many silent minutes, looking many silent minutes at my work. She paused. Never had a friend like Fred, she said. Like the old Joni Mitchell song says, you don't know what you've got till it's gone. The town changed and he'd have moved on just like me. So anywhere, anyway, here I am. Her voice trailed off so I barely heard her. She went back to painting on the quilt panel for him. Given a little privacy, I'd have cried. Uh, Max Ernst is an artist that who's, was surrealistic, dreamlike. You know, we all have these dreams. We just don't paint or write from them often enough. We try to hide it. We try to pretend that this table is real. <laughs> this is a whole other problem. Max Ernst. And the title of this is Girl Talk, M. Ernst. Told me, now this is the visual artist, told me she wasn't sure what her vision was, what it focused on or amounted to. And she said Max Ernst wrote something about being able to see his vision, recognizing it, but never teaching it any words. Once you say the words, they start to slip, and they're all but gone. When, when all said, she said they are gone. Your poetry's made of nothing but pencil scratches and breath, just a little more laying on of the hands. We could lay out your text on my work, or you could work your fingers on the piano. But the song wafts away like the poem, one word, one stroke at a time. In a non sequitur, she continued, maybe that's why hand-minded hand visual artists are better cooks, better lovers than writers, word-minded writers. 
told her I was not ready to concede that, not ready to rally my, my evidence to the contrary, not ready to debate it at all, but I respected the Ernst quote, and when she found it exactly word for word, I'd take it down and lift it up with new words. Or better, I'd present her with the uncarved block. Yes, she told me, what she was after, after all, was what vanishes. Best of all the repeating dream, she saw the hawk, and she was the hawk, riding a thermal up and around, circling despite her fear of letting rising winds take her away over the mountains to the seashore and beyond, ever higher on spiraling currents, until only a speck of herself remained. She told me when she awakened, <clears throat> it was orgasmic where she'd been, what she'd been up to. Now that's from part one. And part one has a, a little quote, a little quote at the beginning that is from Elizabeth Barrett Browning, 1857. If there's room for poets in this world, their sole work represent the age, their age, this, she's writing this in 1857, this live, throbbing age that brawls, cheats, maddens, calculates, aspires, and spends more passions, more heroic heat, Never flinch. I think that's what I'm trying to do. I don't want to flinch. There's another quote from Denise Lovertop. Well, I'm going to read some from uh, part two. That is called Some of the Best of Friends. Some of the best of friends are here in this room. Best of friends and family. Thank you for coming. Yes, you. <laughs> okay, Some of the Best of Friends. This is a quote from Max Hild of Magdeburg, 13th century. It's from a book of... Um, sacred writings by women over the ages. A fish cannot drown in water. A bird does not fall in air. Each creature God made must live in its own true nature. I love that quote. Okay, I decided that I would read, I've got some girl talk poems in here, but I'm going to read some of these subtexts. This is long distance conversation Conversations, plural, for my son and my daughter. When I am gone, he will walk alone in the shallow plat with a vial of my ashes. He will crack the glass he has promised. My 51st spring, this was written quite a few years ago. <laughs> my 51st spring and I sweep dust from the porch onto the leaf-cluttered lawn. She and my granddaughter, that's my daughter and my granddaughter, take long walks, name the birds, the first flowers. My ashes fall into the river. We do not speak of these things with her. She is teaching her daughter to sing. And this is for uh, a poet, some of us know, Barbara Schmitz. This is where the dream emphasis comes in, uh, or impetus, emphasis. Last night dreaming, and in the dream, Barbara shows me her new poem. In, now this is the poem that I dreamed. It was in the dream, the title of the poem. In taking my car to the mechanic. Okay. In taking my car to the mechanic, she's going to see the doctor. That's Bar this is Barbara's poem. I'm going to start again. You know, the dream life, it, it permeates our real life. The head doctors, whom I've never visited, say that this dream life is going on all the time, but we don't pay attention to it because we are paying attention to this table, which we think is real. <laughs> okay. Last night, dreaming, and in the dream, Barbara shows me her new poem. In taking my car to the mechanic, she's going to see the doctor. On that day, experiences none of her long-standing complaints. All in remission, the chronic rhinitis, skin rash, headaches, irregular heartbeats, diarrhea, fatigue, arthritis, breast lumps, rattles, screeches, and knocks all gone. I should say that I'm exaggerating here. This is not a biography of anybody I know, not even myself, but this was the dream. Rattles, screeches, knocks all gone. A week later, they reappear with high-pitched whining. The repair shop can't work her in for another month. I close that dream, get out of bed, go to the fridge for a glass of orange juice, listen to the rain in the hackberry tree. 
a person in middle life, an old car, transmission, choke, and clutch going out, slow but definitely running low on oil, finally burning out, or an old tree leaning away from the wind, a piece of ripe and rotting fruit, a guava maybe, she would say none of these, and I too. We go back to the ether, go back to the light, tabula rasa. Next day, just as the sun sets for real, I call Barbara. She's well, so am I. I don't tell her about her sick car poem. <laughs> Some people say, you do stuff like that all, all, all the time? You write stuff like that? You, you just write? Anyway. Here is the last poem in that section, and it's a um, 1 a.m. poem. And I just was making a note in my journal. Quiet here, writing letters, notes, postcard poems, revising, some of the best of friends on paper. Okay. Three is love, work, and travel. And this is a quote from Dogen, um, 1200, 1253. To let the self be awakened by all things is enlightenment. To let the self be awakened by all things is enlightenment. Okay, here's Girl Talk Trash. She holed herself up in her studio for a while, painting. After a couple weeks of not wanting my company, she called, told me, I miss my long-standing lover, and I don't mean my good Betty Fred. He said he just wanted to think us through, so he, my lover, took off traveling. Haven't heard from him now a month of Sundays or more, and it isn't only the scent of his chest, his hair, his sexual warmth I miss in the morning. It's no, hello, glad you're alive. My world's wonderful with you in it. That deep voice and him to make coffee for, put on some Mozart for, all that daily trash that I miss, she said, that makes my art so one-dimensional so sterile. This is a work of art that this person created, this woman created. And the title of her artwork is, it is Girl Talk, and in parentheses, another little love poem painting. That's her painting. Told me, pointing, this text, points to the text, going around all sides of that black and white abstract. It's a mix of Pollock, France, Franz Klein, Barbara Kreuger, the calligraphy is like Persian script with a scattering of dried wild petals, rose petals. So here's the script, and it's in italic here. Over and over, the unfaithful lover says, if you come back, I would kiss your eyelids, you beautiful animal. The water is deep, and next time I would see into its depths. I told her, a beautiful object the flowers of possibility. And I'm going to read the last one in that section. And it's called Hands. And this is the impetus more or less just flowed out. Um, the impetus was walking. You know when you're walking, your hands just flash, 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 flash. I was walking. My hand flew up and went down like that, and I when I got home, I mean, I live in the real world. My family's here to testify to the fact that I used to cook a lot, <laughs> did a lot of cleaning. The real world is there, but here was this, this hand. The hands at the ends of your wrists are not your hands. They swing far from the heart with its cold streams, from the head with its warm rushes, and when you walk, you are going away from the hands. They can never keep up. They want to get away to get back to old clasps, or go far forward, beating through the wide rivers. They are never satisfied to stay with you and go swinging like gates in the wind. Though your arms hold them hinged, at some point you are walking fast away from them in the direction of hands. Now, oh, that's also in here. I should have read it out of here, too. I'll show it to you right here. See, now this came unbidden, except I reworked it and reworked it and reworked it, as Ted Couser, who is speaking tonight, thank you for coming here, out at Barnes and Noble, his poems he rewrites 38, 35, 40 times. You know, this poem has been written innumerably times, uh, innumerable times. Just the way I practice classical piano, you go over it until you get it the way you want it. But this was the journal note that started it. Okay. 
So that was uh, section two of these two blabbermouths. <laughs> you know, in, in your imagination, you just say, wouldn't it be fun to see Karen again? And you just think, what would go on if you could see her? You ever do that? You do that. Start writing. <laughs> Get it down there. All right. Part three is love, work, and travel. And I want to read a few poems from that section. Um, wait a minute. I just did that one. I read the wrong blurb for this other one. I need a secretary. Okay. Well, we're just going to... You'll have to look at the book. Greg did it beautifully, and so did my friend Jeanette Nakata, who many of us know. Jeanette Nakata used to work here on the press, the Nebraska press. She's now on Nevada. She's working at Nevada Press, and she did this work for Greg. So this book, these books have enormous personal interest to me, my friends helping me put together. Have a look at them. Okay, so this is the one to be awakened by uh, many things is enlightenment. I did read that. Forgive me. <clears throat> Friends will tell me I have this famous quote, uh, and that is, uh, it's not mine really. That's enough about me. What about you? What do you think of me? <laughs> that's, that's Bette Midler in a movie. Anyway, here, here are these girls in the girl talks. The section called Space, and a lot of them are about the visual art. And this is a quote from a Japanese uh, courtesan, sort of a handmaiden. Wouldn't we all love to have a handmaiden lay our clothes out, spray us with perfume, pat our hair till it's just right? Say Shonigan was her name. She wrote about 990. And she said uh, in her notes, things that are near though distant. I had an eighth grade boy over in York once when I said, what is poetry? He said, uh, a poem is too far. An eighth grade boy told me this. A poem is too far, a poem is too close, but too far away. He didn't even know what he said, and he kind of jumped like that, and he said, yeah, I guess that's right. An eighth grade boy. A poem is too close, but too far away. So I was going to read music purity here. She's still talking. Told me I could develop my writing by playing the piano again. Told me. Music, the purest of all art forms. I was thinking not purity, but heart, speaking to heart, as in Beethoven, as in the blues, as in Thelonious Monk. You had a good start, she blurted out. Then you moved down a rung or two with the slippery words. You gave up piano. I asked, oh, perhaps mantras. Wouldn't that be more pure? And what about love poems? told her the love poem may be talking to itself alone. Maybe all poetry does that for the music of it. She spouted, how about playing this up right here? Just a little bit of Mozart, Bach, try playing the piano again, and then just lay the music out there in your poems. Don't try to mean something. Just present it the way music and my sketches do. That's purity. The reader finds the meaning. Told her, you really tick me off when you harp on music and lecture me on aesthetics I already know. Besides, we don't see things the way they are anyway. We see things the way we are. So do you want Dame Edith Sitwell's facade? That's a gorgeous poem. You ought to look at it. It's all music. And they performed it at UNL Kimball Hall in the 70s. It's just gorgeous music. Language. Anyway. So what do you want? I, the literary artist said, Dame Edith Sitwell's facade. It was no use debating, trying to convince her I wouldn't play her piano, a waste of words, so I began studying another of her aid quilts, quilt panels. She was stenciling children's names on it, the many names. One more from that section. And this is Girl Talk High Bird told me she had a friend so high strung if she let go his hand at a concert he'd rise to the rafters a helium balloon uh, a helium balloon a dancer she said he seemed to lift off en point tap skylarking or waltzing one of those boys light on his feet everything in the highest register no one could match his obligato his steps and laugh that fella could laugh at anything the announcement i'd been practicing yoga 
on and off for 20 years, had him snorting as if it were a mantra. However, he couldn't sit, couldn't meditate, but he sure could concentrate. Never saw a fellow so reluctant to give up on a good joke, even when it was on him, even when not really a joke, but a slur, like someone calling him and calling out, Hey, you faggot. He'd treat it as if it were a jest. Even when in the last stages of the plague, he never lost his joie de vie, his joy of life, went out of state to die like an old sparrow crawled off to hide in the shade of some low spirea or currant branches. His feet, his wings, finally stilled, although something remained suspended, floating. And I've asked homophobics, she told me, what if he'd been a son or a brother how could anyone be against anyone so giving, so high-spirited, so full of malarkey, blue mud, the old Blarney? And a little bit from, well, one last poem from there. Uh, this is called Reflections in the Water by W.C. And it's a beautiful piece of music where all of it just sounds like the water being disturbed. It, it just ripples, 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 all the music, and then s some more reflection would come and more ripples to disturb the water. We've all looked at water and seen that. So the painter, painter is trying to, she has the painting. She tells the literary artist, my version of shimmering water. And I told her my impression in the music of her painting, clear to me as her eyes. The calm of blue heights over indigo depths and I hope you can see this painting that the painter has painted. The calm of blue heights over indigo depths and in between cold water resting. Are they frozen, the woman asks those reflections. Could we walk on treetops across the lake? The man, the man mumbles something about Rilke's words, about two solitudes, that he'll stay where he is. He releases her hand. Now the wind rising, the men step, stepping back from the shore, the wind stricken, the women and the man and the trees tossing in the reflection. When she glances at him, he looks up beyond the trees. The wind subsides, the woman peers down, her face falling. And there beside her, the man's likeness also sinking into the foam, the water, the sky, the lowest notes, the high. Debussy has some wonderful music, and his music ends with great octaves, one down here and one down here. So the literary artist sees that, sees all of that in that painting. It's an abstract. It keeps me off the streets. <laughs> anyway, I, it's important to me. Here, this one is Lingo. Lingo, another quote from Elizabeth Barrett Browning from Aurora Lee, 1857. Poets should exert a double vision to see distant things as intimately as if they touched them. Right, and we're going to look at Girl Talk Trail Horses. Told her, we're both so much in love with making our own marks on paper, leaving the trail for others, doubling back when we become lost, but every way curious about what's been pulling at us, not wanting to return to the comfortable, predictable, bright streets of the same old territories, rearing, bucking, tossing those old riders off. Wild horses, what we think we are, I told her, don't ever want to be broken. Not horses, she said. Pioneers or nomads, ramblers, rovers, vagrants, gypsies. Archaeologists, fugitives, I countered. She crossed her eyes, tossed up her hands, turned her face, returned to the postcards for the artists and poets, HIV, AIDS, benefit. This is lingo, girl talk lingo. Yes, I told her I'm in love with paper, the wavelength of a, a rambling lingo, ke keenings, foreshadowings, celebrations. Reader and writer alike, as in mirrors, find themselves as one's face given back on the surface of still water, a mirror, lake or pond, the work of our hands, a lover's eyes.
And this is Girl Talk, the book slash Job, the book of Job. She made a fist, slammed it down on the table, barely missing her palate with blobs of alizarin blue and cochineal red for another HIV poster. I was studying her collages and thought, how like people's lives. You know, collages, you, you know collages where they have these things all glommed. You see part of a tick, bus ticket and then you see a piece of lace. You see an old key, collages, mementos of things. And it just occurs to this writer to say I was studying her collages and thought, how like people's lives. We seldom read complete texts or subtexts, even our own, let alone another's. And there, out of the turquoise blue ocean of her eyes, her palette, her canvas, she asked me, what if there were no book of Job, the scabs, the pestilence, the lost fortunes, the eternal why, whether or not he should curse God and die. This great complainer like David, who shook his fist at God more than once, like Jeremiah's, Why me, O Lord, I am but a youth and cannot speak. And Isaiah's, How long, O Lord, how long? No wusses these, no eternal forgivers. An argument, a wail, gets the blood flowing, the adrenaline. Hide it, then it festers. It's the sharing of it keeps us sane. It keeps us sane, she said, sane. She had to say it twice. It somehow lets in some light. And how about Esther, her wildness, her beauty, saving the Jews, she asked. Or Judith, cutting off the head of the, enemy, the enemy's king. And AIDS itself like an Old Testament plague. These people have been with me for over 10 years, it, more or less 10 years. So they're busy, but not busy enough. I don't think I've done it right yet. This is Knight's Summons in On Holy Ground, the last part. I'm quoting from, not in this poem, but in some of them, I'm quoting from things that I saw over at the University of Nebraska um, on one of the quilts. It's, it's a long poem. I'm just going to read a couple of these before I get back to that one. one on one quilt panel, Millie, a shining star, all in caps. And in bold, and uh, Jeanette put it in bold in the book, Morris Costa, our brave warrior. Uh, Danny will be remembered as a man. See, we try to ignore AIDS. It's out there. This last one signed, The Northern California United Church of Christ, Our Loved Ones Who Walked Into the Light. And then the quote on one of them, Take off your shoes. You're standing on holy ground. Okay, the quotes at the beginning of On Holy Ground, one from the Tao Te Ching, number 16, and that is, each separate being in the universe returns to the common source. Returning to the source is eternity. Those are things we do not like to think about. I think I told Greg I thought I was writing my obituary to write this book. <laughs> and a quote from Carolyn Kaiser, 1993, in her book of essays. He's a wonderful poet, too. Uh, proses. Poetry is not prayer, but it is not not prayer. I want to say that again. Musicians, visual artists, we'd all say the same thing, right? School teachers would say the same thing, maybe, if they thought about it, but it's true. Teaching is not prayer, but it is not not prayer. <laughs> but she says poetry is not prayer, but it is not not prayer. Night Summons, this was written for, um, it came in a dream and my granddaughter Candace was in it and she was crying and I turned around and said, um, go to sleep honey, when we come there I'll wake you, it'll be midnight and the tree will still be blooming its white blossoms, I was over my shoulder. I said, ooh, there's something there. Now in the book it says it's dedicated to John Goldring, the young man who died of AIDS. Candace and I and all of us now know it's for Candace. And before John Goldring died, he said this was his favorite piece. We, uh, artists and visual artists did a whole collection of 50 works of visual art and uh, 36 of my poems dedicated to John. He was in California then. And this was his favorite poem. He thought of it as a resurrection poem. I don't know, but it's for Candace. And Freddie, at midnight I'll wake you and take you to see in the moonlight the white blooming tree. 
Ron Block said I should really have a painting to go with that. At midnight, I'll wake you and take you to see in the moonlight the white blooming tree. I have a couple more minutes, and I'm going to read Girl Talk, Her Art. She's speaking about her art. It's on a phrase from Anna East Nin, which is a tree with portable roots, that uh, women were like myths, trees with portable roots. Don't we like to think of ourselves that way? Come on. Don't we? <laughs> myths, trees with portable roots. She invited me to come over to her studio while she sorted things out one at a time. Told, I told her, you become the very thing you see, friend, and whatever you see, the only tree in the for forest. You know how somebody can just focus and they just really see that, what they're doing? You yourself a tree with portable roots, linden or poplar, tree of paradise or locust, orchard of apple trees. That's a phrase that's haunted me for a long time. Isn't that a pretty phrase? I didn't write it. It came to me. It was a gift. An orchard of apple trees just haunted me. So I tell the, anyway, the literary artist says, you yourself can be an orchard of apple trees in bloom or in fruit. You turn from tree to tree without getting lost. Yes, she said, in my own world, a palette, a canvas, turpentine, paints, brushes, constructions, texts, collages, still lives, the studio chaotic, a muddle, a botch, a hodgepodge, a mess, and yet assembled together a hybrid, a wilderness, savanna, verdant underbrush, perennial seedlings. Told me it's meditating develops her chi, her energy, makes it possible. She elaborated, I look around and say, I can't be lost, I'm right here. I focus, I concentrate, forget the men. Yes, I become the thing I see, landscape or collage, benefit announcement for HIV, an AIDS quilt panel. She studied her reflection in the glass, patted her hair, frowned, then looked away from the mirror into her canvas, a single tree bending, a willow this time bending. I had spoken earlier to Joanna about being an artist in school with second graders in Omaha at Sacred Heart School. And these little second graders are all at my feet, and we're going to talk about poetry. And one little boy curled his lip at me and said, well, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And I bent down and I said, well, I'm here to stretch your imaginations. The boy next to him, Freddie, poked him in the ribs like this, went wham. Yeah, stretch our imaginations further than the eye can see. A second grade boy told me that. See, now, these poems, I hope they stretch your imaginations further than the eye can see. Because we live in a wonderful, wonderful world, and I haven't begun to touch it, and neither have many of our Nebraska poets. I think everybody here should be writing, even Tom. <laughs> I do, and, and Stanley. OK. <laughs> um, return, the, this is for John Goldring, one of the little subtexts, the west wind tearing over and through Rocky Mountains wrapped in clouds, arrives here on the plains wearing her thunder and lightning, asking us to befriend her by tossing our umbrellas, those old protections, until something in us longs to lay down our clothes as when we ran children through a new rain, never asking to be cleansed. Okay, I'm going to read just a couple of little last ones. Lullaby, where'd you disappear to? In fact, I think this will be the last poem I'll read. It's, it's kind of a good night poem. Wrap your arms around your breast or make a cradle for your head and dream as you turn down the bed's dark street. Dream as you turn down the bed's dark street. Thank you very much. Thank you.